Good morning, everybody. Good to have you all with us this morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the 42nd uh, Call Lab Convention. And, of course, we are in Springfield, Missouri. Today is Tuesday, March 31st, uh, 2015. And this is Visit with the Legends session. I am Jerry Reed. I'm from Rockledge, Florida, and I'm very happy to serve as your moderator for this very important uh, session. Today we'll be hearing some of the history of the activity, perhaps a story or two. I believe our history is very important and is sometimes lost in the discussion of dance programs, puzzle-solving techniques, and other interesting topics. On the panel today, we have four fantastic people. I know that to be true because each of them told me they are. <laughs> At the far end of the table, we have John Jones. John Jones is in big trouble. <laughs> We lost a little audio there. <laughs> but John Jones from Arlington, Texas. We have Elmer Sheffield from Tallahassee, Florida. I skipped over Al Stevens from Montgomery, Alabama, recently from uh, Germany. And, uh, and on my immediate right, Mike Seastrom from Los Angeles. We have an hour and 15 minutes for this session, so we will take questions. Uh, however, uh, because we have four uh, very interesting folks to listen to, uh, I would ask that your questions be succinct, which means, uh, John, that means uh, short. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, uh, Let's let's leave our stories for in the hall. They're very interesting to listen to, but they do take time, and we we are kind of limited. So to start us off, I would like to ask Mike Seastrom to uh, provide some of his uh, information that he will have for us, uh, primarily working with uh, some of the legends of the early days, uh, Bob Osgood. Uh, uh, and um, Bob Van Antwerp, some of those those folks in uh, Southern California and other places. A nice hand for Mike. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, somebody said to me in the hallway, how old do you have to be to be a legend? <laughs> and I said, well, we've actually worked our way with these programs through some of the real legends in, in Caller Lab and in Square Dance Calling and in the Hall of Fame. And now we're kind of into the conduits to the legends. I mean, last year, um, it was Dick Henschel that told a lot of the great stories about um, Jim Hilton and Hilton Audio Products because he was a, a young kid that lived upstairs from where Jim uh, and Dottie Hilton made their made sets. So he used to do, you know, some of the behind-the-scenes work and that kind of thing. But he had a great insight. And, and I, too, was lucky enough to grow up in the city that, uh, square dancing was really a, a focal point. Uh, Bob Osgood produced uh, Sets in Order Square Dance magazine there in, in Beverly Hills from 1948 to 85. And I started calling in 1963, and he was literally, literally right over the hill from me. And, and, and that magazine was what most of us relied on in the early years of calling to not only for material but for perspective on calling and, and a lot of things like that. And so... I didn't really meet Bob um, until I was in dental school in 1972, and um, Gail and I decided to take up contra dancing, and and Bob happened to be the teacher and had a great group in the Sets and Order Hall. Well, the minute that I walked into Sets and Order Hall, if anybody had ever been there, it's upstairs, and it's a beautiful, beautiful wood floor, um, a hall that's much smaller than this room even, but all of the walls are paintings, the Frank Grundin paintings of all the Hall of Fame callers. And so it's quite, quite you get taken back as a caller when you start looking around and you start seeing these photographs of people like you know, Lee Helsel and Arnie Cronenberger and Bob Osgood and Bob in Antwerp and uh, 
Jim Mayo and others that were all around the this this hall. And the people that danced in the hall, I think, just took it for granted. They really kind of figured that this was you know just regular stuff. And it was Bob. And, and the magazine was also produced up there on that second floor in this little street on Beverly Hills, just uh, around the corner from Chasen's. Uh, which is where they had great chili and all the stars were. And and, uh, and Bob had a, a great connection with Hollywood and with the motion picture industry. Um, you know, he started calling in 1938 and then um, proceeded to uh, go to uh, Pappy Shaw's uh, school in uh, of Collard's College in 1947. And so a lot of the information that he got came out of, you know, Lloyd Shaw's uh, camp and so he was kind of a disciple of Lloyd Shaw but by the time I was born in 1951 um, Bob had already started a Silomar and which was a vacation institute up in the Monterey Peninsula area at a beautiful little center that uh, a lot of the architecture of that center was uh, developed by the same guy that did all the the uh, uh, the Castle, Hertz Castle, and, and all that. She was the same architecture that did that. So it was a, a beautiful little place that he started this. Anyway, my first my first contact with Bob was at that Contra um, school. And uh, uh, later on, I, I, I'm going to skip forward because we're, I've got a short time here. And But I want to tell you a little story that Bob had an, an office in the back of his house. And I walked into the office one day, and I started to look around because when you walked in the door... There were photographs of square dancers from 1920s era all the way to the end of the room. It was the 1980s. And when you walked in, these were dancers in the 1920s. And most of the guys wore hats. Most of the guys wore just regular kind of work shirts, and the gals wore long dresses. And nothing of Western wear at all. And Bob said, there were, there were no cowboys back there. We didn't have cowboy movies. There were no cowboy heroes. He said, so you didn't see any of those kind of clothes in the 1920s. And the next photo up was the 1930s. And those, ni- those photos in the 1930s, the hats were gone because guys didn't started not wearing hats. Um, so the, the attire of square dancing pretty much followed what people wore at the times. And then you got into the 40s. Still didn't see much Western stuff at all, but the dresses had changed a little bit to match the style that was there. It wasn't until the 1950s in this next photograph that we started to see Western wear. And Bob said, hey, Roy Rogers and Gene Autry, and, and those became the heroes. And so square dancing attire reflected what went on in the 1950s. And then in the 1960s, you started seeing the poofy skirts and the stuff, the, the, the what do you call them, the crenolins, but, but no, the petticoats. And, anyway, you started to see that stuff because people were wearing that in those 1960s. And, and, and yes, I know, I know you are now. But anyway, then, and then you went over to the 1970s, and, and they had changed a little bit more. But from the 70s and the 80s, nothing had changed. Literally, the square dance attire looked exactly alike. And that, those were the last photos he had in the 80s. And I said, Bob, it's just interesting that it's kind of frozen here. And he goes, you know why? I said, why? He said, and he was sitting at his desk the whole time. And, and I'm just talking to him as I walk around the room. And he said, he said, because between the 70s and the 80s, late 60s and into the 80s, now, he said, square dancers begin manufacturing their own square dance clothes. He said, back in, in the early years, he said, he said, women were sewing. More women were sewing. But as we go later, women don't sew as much anymore. And he said, uh, they were manufacturing their own clothes. And he says, so square dance attire has frozen from the 70s to the 80s, and he said, but women aren't sewing as much anymore, and some of those stores are, are, you know, going by the wayside. He says, so we're in for another evolution of the American costume, of the square dance costume, and he says, you don't see that many cowboy movies and those kind of things anymore. He says, so you're going to see that entire change, and he kind of accepted that, that that was a, a, a change that was going to happen. Um, the only other story, and I've probably got another minute. One of the stories I'd like to relate is as a young caller, I went into a dance where Arnie Cronenberger was calling because somebody said, you got to hear Arnie. And, and uh, I, I, I watched him call, and I danced the first couple of tips. I noticed that he had an earphone in, an earplug in there. And so I, at one tip, I, I came up, and I introduced myself, and, and I said, is, is that your music? you have a monitor in there? And he, he kind of laughed. He says, no, I'm just listening to the Dodger game. And I... <clears throat> And to this day, I, and the last time I talked to Arnie was in the in the eighties, um, and 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 I and I asked him about that, and he just laughed and he wouldn't confirm it, he wouldn't he wouldn't say anything, but I can't, I still can't imagine anybody calling with a baseball game in your ear. I I I I, I wouldn't know. I did, I don't know. <laughs> but 
But anyway, I, it, I think I was just lucky enough to grow up during that time to have mentors. Bob Van taught me a lot of about calling and uh, was quite a gentleman. He also taught me a lot about after parties. Uh, I've never, uh, as serious of a man as that was, he could show you how to, to move so that your, your dress would bounce around the right way. And, and I, <laughs> till still to this day, I can't even imagine. I'm looking at Bob going, that doesn't compute, Bob. I can't even, you know. And so, but it was, it was fun. I was really fortunate to be at that time and grow up and have those people as, as my mentors. And uh, to this day, I, I really cherish that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, any uh, any quick questions, comments for Mike? Um, if so, we have the remote mic to uh, get that on the tape. Thank you, Mike. Very, very interesting. Next up, uh, Elmer is going to talk about his early experience with uh, record producers and how he became uh, one of the leading music producers. And I know that's true because it's written right here. Elmer. Like I sent it to you. Well, the first thing um, I, f- I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not a legend. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm on this legends panel. I don't feel like I'm a legend, even though uh, I am sitting here with John Jones, who probably is a legend. But r- r- I'll just kind of tell you quickly uh, what happened in my life in, in Square Dance. And uh, around 1968. Uh, at the insistence of of, uh, of an uncle and an aunt, they uh, drug me and March out to square dance classes, or wanted us to come to classes. And we went out one night, and uh, we were not too impressed. We we were kind of saying, when can we leave? How long do we have to stay? And so we finally got away, and we didn't come back. Well, the next time they had a class, they they got us again. And this time, the club had changed callers. They had a, a guy who was just fun and just great. And I got hooked. She wasn't all that hooked on it to begin with, but uh, I said, well, we're going. So by the time we got probably a, a third of the way through lessons, I wanted to sing. I wanted to sing those songs just like he was doing. I didn't care about calling patter. Just let me sing. So his name was Johnny Everett, who's now passed on. But he he got me to the side, and he said, here, take this record and learn it. And and then one club night, we'll get up and get called. And I remember till today, it was, and then you go and spoil it all by saying something stupid like I love you. And that was my first singing call. So uh, from there, I, I learned a few more singing calls. And, and every club night, Johnny would say, okay, come up and call a, a singing call. And that's what I did. Well, uh, about a year later, and I, I may get ahead of myself here, but uh, anyway, about a year later, Johnny got transferred, and the club come to me and said, would you be our caller? And I said, shoot, I can't call. I know about six singing calls. I said, I can do them over and over each night. And they said, no, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. We want you. So uh, to move on, I learned a few more singing calls. And our club was basically a singing call <laughs> group because I couldn't call, Patter, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I, I couldn't stand it. So uh, uh, around 1970, a, a, a friend in the club said, man, you got a good singing voice. He said, you, you, you should be recording. And, uh, and back in those days, recording on a square dance label was uh, a lot different than it is today. I mean, this is just my opinion. But back in those days, there was a, a certain amount of prestige to being, able, to being a, a, a recording artist. Uh, today, you can be a recording artist. It don't take a whole lot. But uh, anyway, he said, let's make a CD. And in case you don't know what a CD is, it's a little little thing like that. So we made a CD of me doing a few singing calls, and we sent them to uh, Norman Murbach in Texas, uh, somebody else, and, and to Don Williamson, who was then re- doing Red Boot Records. And uh, Norman Norman called me back and said that at the time he was uh, wasn't looking for anybody. Oh, and at the time... Uh, 
uh, Bob Van Antwerp had a label, and he said the same thing. He said, Elmer, you have a nice voice, but we don't need anybody right now. But Don Williamson said, do you have a song that you would like to record? And he had a label at that time that was called Flutter Wheel. It was, there was Red Boot, and then his second label was Flutter Wheel. And he said, uh, if you got a song you want to record, we'll do the music, and it'll cost you $250 to do this record. So about this time, Gary Shoemake, who I had become friends with, came through town, and he said he was recording with Kalox at the time. He said, I have a song that, that I was thinking of doing, but it's it's going to be a while before I'm going to do it. He said, why don't you take it and see if Don wants to do it? And it was called Good Morning Country Rain. So I sent the thing to Don, and uh, he cut the music. And then I flew to Knoxville, Tennessee, to do the vocal on that thing. And uh, Ted Fry, who is now passed on too, was also recording with Don, and he, he tried to buy that song from me. He said, he said, you, you let me do that one, and I'll let you do mine. He had one. I said, no, Ted, I've been working on this thing for months. And I said, so moving on ahead, uh, we went to the Jasmine Center, I believe, or somewhere, and we practiced. And, and Don said, I ain't going to put that on flutter wheel. He said, I'm going to put that on red boot. And he said, it ain't going to cost you nothing. So. I recorded Good Morning Country Rain, and at that time, Bob Osgood had the magazine, which had listed the, the five or so top singing calls every month. That record was number one for about six months. So then Don says, you know, you did pretty good on the first one. So, so he said, let's do, uh, and, and let me just think, my mind's old. My body's okay, but my mind's, you know. But I, but I did uh, Riding My Thumb to Mexico, Monday Morning Secretary, Ain't Love a Good Thing, uh, and I could go on and on. At one time, we had three of the top five records in sales. So uh, I became an overnight success. You tell me when I need to stop. Uh, but all of a sudden, I started getting letters. Didn't get any emails in those days. There was no such thing as computers. But I get letters from, from festivals all around the country, California, Texas, everywhere. We'd love to have you come and do our festival. And I said, a guy that can only do six singing calls, and I'm going to go to a festival? But they all they knew was I did records. And my records were, you know, were, were hits at the time and callers were using them and callers like John would go in and, and he'd say, hey, here's a brand new record by Elmer Sheffield and they, and they heard my name. So, of course, at first I turned them down. I said, you know, folks, I'm not quite ready for that. So, uh, any, anyway, uh, I said, i got to learn to call patter. i got to learn to call patter. So I wrote me some down. Head square through, four hands around, swing the corner promenade. That was, that was the height of my calling. But I, uh, we were. My dad was selling international trucks at the time, and we won a, a fishing trip out of Miami for a week. None of us were fishermen, so my dad says, "Son, you want to take this trip?" And I said, "No, yeah, I'm second thought." So I called Jack Lazary, who some of you may know, and I said, "Jack, are you gonna be around for this week?" He said, "Yeah." He said, "Come on down. We'll just sit and, and talk every day." I went to Jack's house. Five days, Monday through Friday, we sat at his coffee table, and he didn't teach me how to call patter, but he he taught me the way to learn to call patter, and I started to call patter, and today I can call patter. Am I the best patter caller in the, in this group? No, but I can call patter, and I can call good enough to fool most people. So that 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 got me, and then I started traveling. Uh, you know, around. I started taking up some of those offers, and, and I did for, for many years until I got too old. And, and of course, my wife, Margie, she had a stroke uh, four years ago, as most of you know, and, and that also slowed my uh, moving around a whole lot. Not that I regret it, because I'm glad she's still with me. But uh, I, I could just go on and tell you tons and tons of stuff, but my time's about up. But I really appreciate you guys having us here and listening to us, okay? Are we legends? Hey, probably in our own minds. But if you think we are, that's good, okay? And, and, and I do appreciate that, really. Uh, 
El- Elmer, maybe you could tell just a short little uh, uh, snippet of how uh, ESP got started. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I recorded for Don Williamson for Red Boot Records for uh, 10 years. You know, 10 years, okay. He did maybe, uh, and, and I'm guessing at this, maybe 50 or 60 records for Don. And then around 1980, I just had that old urge that a lot of us get or got back in our younger days. I wanted to do my own thing, my own label and my own. And I talked to Don, and, and he was perfectly in agreement with that. Uh, he hated for me to go, but, hey, time moves on. So I started ESP, and uh, and we've been pretty successful with it, too. I've sold quite a few records, and uh, no more because we don't have records. Uh, also, uh, I have recorded. I have recorded now about 460 square dance tunes. Uh, a lot of them are for ESP. A lot of them for Red Boot. And then I've also been a guest artist on 10 or 12 labels. Just about all the labels except. Uh, except Rhythm and uh, what's that other one? Royal. And they haven't decided yet whether I've quite made that that grade to, to do a record on their label, but they have talked to me about it. But it's just something I love doing. It's not because I think I'm I'm the best singer around because I'm, I'm not, even though Margie says I am. But... Uh, it's just something I love to do, and so I've done it for years, and I've got some real good artists on my label that record for me, and uh, and we're still at it. We're still at it. Thank, thank you, Elmer. Very, very interesting. Uh, next, we're going to ask uh, Al to uh, provide us some, uh, some talk. Uh, he's going to talk about his experience of being one of the pioneers of bringing... Uh, square dancing to Europe, including teaching dancers and uh, teaching callers and his experience with that. Al Stevens. Thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, Again, um, (laughs) I, along with the rest, don't belong here. They said it. I don't consider myself a legend. I consider myself just a, a country boy that enjoys uh, what he does. Um, back in 1958, I graduated from a teenage club in uh, Derry, New Hampshire. And uh, our club caller hit us with the word that he was going to have to shut down our Saturday afternoon dance on a certain date because... Uh, he couldn't find uh, a substitute caller. He had a business engagement that would take him out of town. And he would not be able to uh, find a caller. So I told him, I said, uh, I'll try. He said, well, it, it's coming up in about five or six weeks. I said, well, I, I, can, I can borrow some of your records, and I sing along with all your singing calls. <laughs> and um, anyway, he... Uh, uh, lent me a bunch of records and I took them home and I practiced them and learned them and, and whatnot. I went to a dance that Marshall Flippo was was calling. He came through on a on a on a trip. Walked up to him. I said, "Mr. Flippo, uh, I'm I'm going to be soloing, doing my first solo dance by myself in about three weeks, but I can't call Patter." Sound familiar? (laughs) And he said to me, "Uh, how many singing calls do you know? I said, I've got about 10 that I know. He said, take those 10 singing calls. You'll probably have time to do eight. Put eight singing calls on the the table in order. And he said, do you know the figures to all of those singing calls? I said, sure. He said, well, take the figure for the eighth record and put it in the pattern of your first tip and change 
swing the corner to Alaman left, and you've got it. So I said, hmm, okay. Do a couple of circle breaks, and that's, I said, wow. And then he said, take from the seventh record the, the figure and use that in your patter presentation for the second tip. I said, oh, okay. Uh, gee, this is easy. And then uh, I said, but isn't there going to come a chance for an overlap? He said, when do most clubs take their refreshment break? <laughs> right in the middle. I said, wow, I never thought of that. <laughs> that was my, my introduction to calling. Um, I joined the Air Force, and the Air Force was uh, reluctant enough to take me all over the world, uh, from Vietnam to uh, Germany. Um, and being the the, the uh, traveling kind and having to uproot every so often and get into a new area uh, helped me quite a bit uh, in, in my, my progression as a caller. I was stationed in California and had, had a uh, phone call one day from Lee Halsell in Sacramento. He called me up and said, Al, I've got to uh, go away on a business trip and I need a replacement, blah, blah, blah. So I accepted. I went went to his uh, his club, and I'm getting ready to uh, to call. I'm in, into my third tip, and in the door come the man that was supposed to leave on a flight two hours ago. Lee Helsel walked in and stood there, and all of a sudden my focus changed from the dancer to the caller. And I learned a very valuable lesson on you should call to express and not to impress. Another valuable lesson learned. I eventually ended up in, uh, in Germany in 1978. And uh, I got there just as two legends had really left before me. Chris Veer, very instrumental in, in getting the program started, and Cal Golden, who was there in twice, in the 50s and in the, again in the early 70s. Uh, and then I, I followed into their footsteps. I got off the airplane in Frankfurt, and uh, after retrieving my luggage and coming through customs, I saw this huge banner that said, Welcome, Al Stevens. And I said, Holy mackerel, what's this? Discovered it was not my calling attributes that was the result of that, uh, the, the, uh, the banner. It was the fact that I was the first member of Caller Lab that had stepped foot on European soil. And along with that, I brought Caller Lab's recommendations. And it didn't take long working one-on-one -on -one talking to the European callers that uh, our, the, the recommendations that Caller Lab made actually do work if you work the recommendations as they are written. Okay. Um, I then went on and became a, an accredited caller coach at the uh, arm twisting of Al Brundage and Bill Peters. And uh, they were both instrumental in, in getting me into the accreditation process. And uh, Ken Rattusi says that, <laughs> he said, it's because of you that I became an accredited caller coach. And I said, why? He said, man, I looked down that list, and he said, every one was a somebody. And then I came to Al Stevens. I don't know this guy. <laughs> so he said, if somebody like that, who I did, the name I didn't recognize, can make it, he said, maybe I can make it too. And he, he went ahead and became accredited, and, and the rest is history. Um, I ha had... Uh, always dreamt of 
establishing my own schools. And I've had the, uh, the pleasure of uh, the wisdom of people like John Jones. John came over and gave me my oral examination along with Bill. Bill uh, proctored the written exam, which I passed, and he did the oral phase one. We, we uh, put down on video cassettes, not C CDs. We didn't have CDs then. He put on videos, uh, I mean audio cassette, the uh, first half of the uh, oral examination. Uh, he took those seven or eight cassettes home, sent them to John. John reviewed them because John was coming over some five months later to do my call of schools. Bill was there doing a dance. Passed the oral exam and uh, the rest is history. To date, I've uh, accomplished 183 full curriculum caller schools. Um, I, I've lost track of the number of, of callers that I became interested, uh, that I touched. But through my caller training, uh, the European Callers and Teachers Association went from under 100 members to over 400 in about a 10 year period. The Dancers Association grew tremendously. The, the uh, entire square dance program took on a different look than it had. And um, unfortunately, uh, family problems came and gave me the green light to consider coming home. And after I fulfilled my contractual obligations in Europe, I uh, decided to emigrate and come back home. Um, since I started my square dance career in New Hampshire, my, my thought process said, uh, go back to New Hampshire when you retire from the military and when you retire, period, buy a snow shovel, <laughs> put it on your shoulder and start marching south. And the first town you come to where somebody says, what's that on your shoulder? That's where I want to retire. <laughs> where they don't know anything about shoveling. But my son, uh, my oldest son, convinced me that, uh, why don't you come a little further south to Montgomery, Alabama? And he now lives three and a half miles from me, and I've got my three grandchildren there. And Opa has a swimming pool in his apartment complex. <laughs> My, my, my good friend John Jones here, when he, the first time I, I uh, was communicating. <laughs> the first time, <laughs> the first time I was communicating with him, again, we didn't have uh, emails. Uh, it was this or snail mail. So I called his, his uh, John's number and uh, I got his answering machine. John's message was, Howdy, your turn. <laughs> In that deep voice that he has. I tell a story about my, my ex and I uh, had a fight one day and didn't speak for about two or three days. And I told her one, uh, one Sunday afternoon, I'm going out for a ride. And she said, where? I said, in the, in the country, I don't care. I'm just, just going out. She said, okay, let's go. Okay. Got in the car, we're driving through the country, and about half an hour into the, the uh, drive, not one of us had spoken a word. And finally, we come across a, a farm of pigs. And I looked out, and I said, uh, Relatives of yours? <laughs> she looked and followed the, the pigs as we passed, 
and then in that John Jones way, took her head from right to left, ever so slowly, looked at me and said, yeah, in-laws. <laughs> True story, no. <laughs> I went to the hospital. They told me in about three weeks I'd probably be able to see out of one eye. <laughs> that uh, about wraps up my uh, session. Anybody have any questions, comments, gripes, complaints? Thank, thank you. Al. One in the back. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Were you? No. Were you in Europe when uh, Plus? was introduced to the Saturday Night Dance? No. Yeah. I, was at, I was in Europe. I got there in 1978. Caller Lab had, had a plus one and plus two program in 1978. 1979, we merged them together into plus. We did not have plus to dance at all. On a Saturday I taught night the night. very first plus class in Heidelberg. But it, it wasn't when I was there, it wasn't on a Saturday night dance. You could have two dancers in a town. One was mainstream, one was plus, but you could not have mainstream with an ounce plus. No, we didn't have that uh, that problem yet. All right. Thank, thank you. Um, Al, perhaps a snippet or two about how uh, square dancing uh, started to expand into Russia and the Czech Republic. Um, I don't know how it expanded into Russia. Uh, I know that uh, Kenny Reese was very uh, a, a very popular caller. Kenny went through my accreditation program. He went through my caller coach program, and he was a successful uh, caller coach as well. And uh, he he had a lot of tour groups that he brought. Uh, and there was a German Russian association in Germany, based in Germany, uh, that was involved in trying to expand uh, square dancing in Russia. And uh, Kenny was uh, uh, very instrumental in that, in that process. Although, uh, uh, this was in the mid-80s. Uh, however, in the early 80s, I was on a, a Mediterranean cruise. I was hired to, to call uh, from a square dance club in Munich on a Mediterranean cruise, and we did stop in Odessa, and I did a demo in Odessa in 1982, uh, about five years before they started the move. Prague uh, began to open up when uh, the tension eased between uh, the Cold War, between Russia and the United States. They, when the wall came down in Berlin, uh, it opened up a, a vast new uh, place for us to, to expose the activity. I was the first caller to go into Sweden uh, and call a, um, what they called a convention. Uh, it was the Ericsson Jamboree in Stockholm uh, back in the early 80s. And uh, from that, Sweden has really uh, mushroomed. They took the, uh, the recommendations of Caller Lab to this extent in the beginning. They be believed in starting with BASIC, and they spent six months teaching the BASIC program. Then they were taken out of a learning mode and put into a dance mode for six months. And for six months, all of the major festivals that were coming up featured a hall for the basic dancers. So they danced for six months. Then they went into mainstream. And they learned the mainstream program for six months. Then they were taken out of that learning mode and put into a dancing mode. And it didn't take long. By the time dancers reached the plus class, they'd been dancing for three years. 
it was it was amazing and the the level was was so high uh, that it was uh, enjoyable <laughs> okay thank you Al I and it does show that uh, Call Lab has very good ideas and set out a very good plan. And uh, if you follow that plan, uh, it can be successful. I think perhaps some of the concerns here in the United States was by the time the plan became uh, developed and, and codified that uh, we were already down the road uh, quite a ways. Uh, but also uh, Al's story about the the uh, cooperation to Germany and and Russia. Uh, looking back to some of those World War II uh, films, uh, you would think that that could never never happen. Nor could uh, square dancing grow the way it has uh, in in Japan. And I believe part of that is the uh, the the great the greatness of this uh, of this wonderful activity. Um, and I apologize to Elmer, but we I kind of skipped over him. Are there were there any questions or comments uh, uh, for Elmer? Name and town, please. Don Beck, Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. Um, it's not a question for Elmer; it's just a comment to fill in some of the the story he told. I met Elmer in 1970. I just found out today that was two days, two years after he started calling. It was at a caller school in Colorado. There were many, many people there, and I didn't really get to know Elmer and Margie very well, but, you know, part of the group. Um, several years later, Good Morning Country Rain came out on Red Boot, and I'd been listening to all the new Handhurst tapes and all this. And I said, Elmer Sheffield, I don't know that, I know that name. And I went back, and there was a group picture of, of, of that group at the caller school, and there's way in the background, Elmer and Margie, and I remember, yeah, they were the quiet ones. <laughs> I do remember that you guys had driven, I think, a truck all the way from Florida up to Colorado, um, and we've been friends ever since. It's a great thing. I was at Frank Lane's uh, Estes Park caller school, uh, Jerry Hay, Earl Johnston, and some other uh, – before John takes over, Don, uh, talking about that, Margie and I drove all the way to Frank Lane's place, and uh, we took a tent. It was raining like the devil. That tent leaked. All, we might as well have slept out in the rain. <laughs> and then on top of that, we saw these little furry things running around on the ground going in holes. And, <laughs> uh, what were they? Hedge Hedge. I don't know what they were. Could have been a damn walrus as far as I knew. <laughs> yeah, good morning, country rain. Oh, good morning. If that was Colorado, those little critters were probably breakfast. I would just like to make a Mike Driscoll. I'm from Minnesota. Um, this year I'm going to be celebrating 50 years of calling. Uh, I'd like to make a statement to these guys. They made a statement before that said, we don't feel like we are legends in, you know, well, you're what, what I call my icons. You're the people, when I first came into the activity, that I saw, that I molded myself after. People who, like Lee over here, who set a standard for me to achieve. So you may not think that you are a legend, but in my mind, you are. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We're running pretty much ahead of schedule. I should not tell John Jones that. Uh, John, uh, again from Arlington, uh, Texas, uh, he's going to talk about his vast experience during the early days of our activity and his travels around the world, including China, Germany, Russia, and others. John Jones. I can say that I'd rather just stay seated if you don't mind. If we need anything out of you, Lee, we'll ask you. 
I can say very proudly that I have been on stage calling with these other three guys that are on the panel right here. And uh, when I was eight years old, learning to plow with a mule, there's no way I could have dreamed that I would have ever done what I've been able to do with regard to square dancing. The first call I ever did was in 1947 when I was in the seventh grade in Mississippi. I'm a native Texan, but my folks moved to Mississippi in 1940, and we lived over there for 10 years. My mother was a fourth grade school teacher, and she taught, taught a square how to dance. And one of the dancers in that square was Miss America of 1959, Marianne Mobley. And uh, last week, I got a call from the Convention and Visitors Bureau here in Springfield that Dana had given them my number. And they interviewed me about why I come to Caller Lab and some of my history. And I told her this story about making that first call in Mississippi. And I said, I don't remember the calls or the figure that we did, but the name of the song that I used was called Picking Up Pawpaws, Putting Them in the Pocket. And this lady here in Springfield started singing Picking up pawpaws, putting them in your pocket. Picking up pawpaws, putting them. And that's the exact song. I said, my God, you know this song. And she said, yes, I'm an old country girl. And I said, but she's not really very old, I found out. But anyway, that was what I did. I didn't know what I was doing, but I did it. Then we moved back to Texas and did a little bit of square dancing in school, in high school. When a bunch of us kids got together and we rented and barred an abandoned building downtown and cleaned it up and started square dancing in it and it's a small town and the church going people made us quit because that was sinful being in there dancing like we were doing you know so we quit that then uh, I moved to Arlington Texas in 1955 and got serious about it and had done a little bit previous to that but got really involved in it and after I learned to call a little bit in those days most of the festivals were multiple caller callers and uh, nobody got paid maybe maybe the MC and a whole bunch of us would get invited to come and call on the program and we did and I was there and the legend in our area at that time was Ray Smith and he's about six foot six and a huge man booming voice and was a great guy and I was standing there, maybe a hundred squares on the floor dancing in a huge building. And a caller was calling. And after a couple of minutes, there was nobody dancing on the floor. And he kept calling. Everything we did then was memorized. The whole sequence would be memorized. And so he just kept on calling. Everybody standing there doing nothing. Ray walked over to me and he said, look at there, John. That old boy can call so good that can't nobody dance to him. <laughs> and that taught me a big lesson right then. Try to call where people can dance. I can say that I have called and demonstrated square dancing in 24 different countries around the world. And I'm proud of that. Some stories that involve me, and, and I think there are more funny stories involving Ken Bauer than anybody else in the business. Lots of them. And... I was the first person to hire Ken to come to Texas to call a dance because Marshall Flippo had told me he was a good caller, so I hired him. And he came down. He'd been on my case to come to Des Moines and call for a long time. Well, I was working. I had a full-time job. I couldn't take off any time I wanted to. So I finally got to a point where I could, and they booked me to come in and call the uh, Illinois State Festival. I mean, Iowa, excuse me. And uh, it was with Harry Lackey. And Ken insisted that we stay at his house. But he said, I'm not going to be there. And I said, no, I'm not going to stay at your house if you're not going to be there, Ken. And, but he said, no, my mother and dad are coming in. They're going to stay with us, and, and we want you and Harry to stay at our house. Dee will be there, and the kids will be there in the whole bit. So we finally did. And we'd go to the dance, and we would ride with Dee to the hall. And when Harry was calling or round dancing was being played, I was dancing with Dee, and especially on round dances we would get up and round dance and their son Jeff who was eight years old would follow us around the dance hall walking along beside us 
And after the second round dance, I told Jeff, I said, Jeff, you don't have to follow us around. You can sit if you want to because we'll be back in a little bit. And he looked up at me and he said, uh-uh, my daddy told me to watch you. <laughs> well, I didn't see Jeff again. They moved to California, and I didn't see him again until he was 16 years old. And I was out there calling a dance in the park where Ken and Dee lived. Ken was gone again. But I wasn't staying with them. And I was on the stage calling, and I looked up, and I saw Jeff come into the back of the hall, about 30 squares on the floor. I just lifted the needle. We were using the records, of course, and I lifted the needle off the record, and I said, folks, there's a young man coming in the back door back there that I'd like to point out to you, and I told this story on him. He dove over a bar and hid. He wouldn't come out. <laughs> Funny stories about it. When I was about 30 years old, I got booked to come to Louisville, Kentucky, to call a dance. Huge crowd. In those days, we had big crowds. And I was having a ball. Well, somebody had come through our ear and showed us what a yellow rock was. And I thought, man, that's cute. That's great. And, you know, So I, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky, and I showed them how to do yellow rock right before the first tip. Well, when the second tip started, I called another yellow rock to start th the tip with. After that tip was over, like I said, I'm 30 years old. There was a sweet little old lady came up to the edge of the stage, and her head was just barely above the edge of the stage. She said, excuse me, sir. Could I speak with you? I said, sure, let me get down. I got down off the stage, and she was a short lady, about a lot his height. And she looked up at me, and she said, I love your calling, and I love your voice, but you can take that yellow rock and stick it right up your ass. She said, I choose who I hug, not you. I've never called another one since. If that offended somebody, it ain't worth using. Another funny story, uh, of course, most of you know that I was married to Shirley, and uh, she's the mother of our kids. I was going to Del Rio, Texas to call a dance. I flew to San Antonio, and I rented a car. And the license plate on the car was New Mexico license plate. So I drove to Del Rio, and Shirley had asked me to pick up a quart of Mexican vanilla. And the amphetamine I was ever used Mexican vanilla is highly concentrated, lasts forever. Cost a dollar and a quarter at that time to get a quart of vanilla. I went to the motel and checked in, and I said, I'm going to go get that quart of I unloaded the car. I didn't have anything in it. I'm going to go get that quart of vanilla and get it over with before the dance. So I drove across the first store, bought a quart of vanilla, turned around, started back, and I'm in line with the traffic to go through the U.S. Customs. And I thought, holy crap. Here I am by myself. I'm in a rent car. I live in Texas. The license plate's from New Mexico. And the only thing I bought was a dollar and a quarter quarter vanilla, and ain't no way I'm going to convince those customs agents that I ain't been in Mexico doing drugs or whatever might happen to be. I got up there to the customs, and the guy said, what'd you buy? And I said, this quarter of vanilla. And he said, pull right over there. I thought, boy, here we go. Well, they came over and interviewed me about everything. They looked through the whole car. They've got more authority than anybody in the world. They can tear your car to shreds and walk off and leave you standing there with it. They went through everything in the car, looked under it with the mirror and the whole bit, and I said, you can keep the quarter of vanilla. I don't care. Let me go. I've got things to do he said stay right here they went in I told this guy you know, I, I'm, I'm, he said why are you doing here I said, I'm here to call a square dance tonight for the Del Rio club stay right here went inside here come a little lady out she was his supervisor she said why are you here I said I just told him she said I hadn't heard it tell me so I told her the same story I said I'm here to call a square dance and all I bought was that darn bottle of vanilla you can keep it bust it if you want to I don't care she said come with me I, thought, I am gone went inside and walked back to a table and she raised a sheet that was over the table and said here's the cake you're going to have at the dance tonight it said welcome John Jones <laughs> true story I knew I just knew I was going to jail. <laughs> the first time I went to Germany to call was in 1980 with a tour group. 
and my first experience there, uh, Rudy Pohl asked me to do a workshop. And I thought, I said, well, how do I do a workshop? I don't speak Dutch. He said, do it just like you do at home. So I got up huge, probably 250 squares on the floor. So I started doing a workshop, teaching them something that they had not had or a different twist on some of the mainstream figures or whatever. And all the time I was teaching, there was more talking going on than I have ever heard in my life. And I was really upset. I thought, how rude. I was chairman of the board of Collar Lab at that time. I'm chairman of the board of Collar Lab. Why are they being so rude to me and talking while I am talking, teaching? And so after it was over with, I went and told Rudy that I didn't appreciate it. He said, John, did they have any problem dancing what you called after you taught it? And I said, no, not at all. And he said, I'm very sorry. I forgot to tell you there's a translator in every square out there on the floor, and everything you say they're translating to the rest, to the German people who don't understand English. And then after I understood that, I was, it was great. You know, I really had a good time, but that was an experience there. Jerry, stop me whenever you think. I've got, I've got a whole darn sheet of stuff to talk about. It'd take me forever to tell everything I know. And uh, my oldest brother was the uh, executive director of the American Quarter Horse Association for 10 years. Their headquarters in Amarillo. In Columbus, Ohio, is the largest horse show in the world every year. Well, he was there at the Quarter Horse Show, and they have a rodeo and a r horse races and everything else imaginable. Three or 4,000 people participating in this horse show. And they had, on Thursday night, they had a uh, Western party. But it was, Don said it was dull. He said it was very dull. And they asked him, said, what can we do to liven up this Western party? He said, you need a square dance. They said, we don't know any callers. He said, I do. So he called me and told me what the situation was. He said, would you be willing to come up here and call for him on Thursday night? And I said, sure. So I worked it out where I could get the time off. Well, they called me to about doing it, and I asked them if they had ever done a square dance before. And the man said, yeah, I think we did one on a horse trail one time. Well, I knew what I was up against. It was a party-type situation. So I went in, flew up there, and got a guy in Fort Worth that uh, had – a booth up there every year he hauled my equipment up there and i flew up there got in this hot building and it was like an airplane hangar it was huge but there was a thousand people in there for this western party on thursday night they had a full orchestra on stage and a female singer and she was using the house sound and you can imagine what the house sound was in this big tin building it was awful and they they played for about 45 minutes, I guess, and then they told me it was my turn to take over. Well, I had uh, a 50 watt, 56 watt Newcomb and a DRC column standing up there on the stage in this huge building. And I had asked that lady singer, I said, Would you like to use my microphone, my sound equipment? She said, No, I don't want to do that. And I said, Okay. So when it was time for me to get started, my brother Don was standing at the very back of the room, and I picked up the microphone. And I said, Don, can you hear me? And he shook his head, Yes. So I said, okay, let's all square dance. Had uh, eight couples got up on the floor, and they made a square. And I went through just a little bit. And I said, all of you go out in the audience and get somebody else. So they came back. I got four squares. I went through a little bit of play party stuff. I said, all of you go out in the audience and get somebody else. And they came back. I got eight squares. So I thought, boy, I can play with this, you know. And go. I went just a little bit longer, and all at once, the people out in the audience started waving their head. Whoa, whoa. Of course, there was an open bar back there in the back. And you know, whoa, stop, 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 shut her down. I said, what's the problem? They moved all the tables and all the chairs back, and I had nearly a 1,000 people up square dancing in just a short while. And it, it, it went really well. And as soon as it was, it was over with, we went for about 45 minutes, and then it was time to break and let the orchestra come back. And the lady came up, and she said, may I use your microphone? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am, you sure may. But she shouldn't have done that because she was a half-tone flat the whole time. <laughs> And and my brother Don was a musician. He took his hat and covered up his ears with it, you know. 
Well, that went for about 15 minutes, and I took off again, and that orchestra director said, we're leaving. And I said, why are you leaving? He said, I've never seen anybody in my life get that many people up and have that much fun. You've got them all up doing something, and we can't get them to do anything, so we're going to leave. Well, I stayed there till midnight doing all kinds of stuff. I did play party stuff and everything and circle dances and whatever I could think of. But with that and on that, there was always, after that, I went for five years in a row and had country singers and entertainers Dave Dudley, Jeannie C. Riley, Jerry Wallace, Gene Shepard, Roger Miller, Lynn Anderson, and even Doc Severinsen. And I called and sang and played with each one of those. Great experience. Mike was talking about uh, last year in the Legends that they talked about Dick, uh, Jim Hilton and, and uh, what Dick Henschel had done with them. The way we got the AC-200, the first time we ever got that, was... Uh, Jim Hilton had been on my case for a long time to buy one of his sets. Well, I wouldn't do it because it was too much equipment and it, a whole bunch of stuff in those days. And Don Franklin and I started on him to build something that we could carry on an airplane. He said, Jim was very hard-headed, and he said, Nah, I don't want to mess with that. Well, Don Franklin told him, he said, You're not smart enough to build one. About six months later, we had the AC-200. I bought one. Well, after that, now, after a few years of that, and then I told him, I said, I want one that's smaller, Jim. It's too big. It'll go under the seat, but they've made the seat smaller. And I said, I want a little bit, something smaller. No, I'm not going to do that. And I looked at him. I said, you ain't smart enough to build one. About six months later, he called me, and he said, I'm going to send you something. He sent me the first Micro 75 that he built. And I've got the last one that he built still in my car that I carry around. So that's how we got the AC-200 and the Micro 75, and he started building all kinds of stuff like that. Another experience that I had, and this is uh, true. These are all true stories. I ain't lying to nobody. And uh, callers and cures reading all their material, I didn't approve of. I thought we were supposed to learn all that stuff. Anyhow, one night down in Houston, I was calling a dance, and there was a very well-known round dance cure cueing the rounds, and and I watched him, and I danced with other ladies that were there, and he was reading everything. His whole cueing was with the paper in front of his face. There were about 30 to 35 couples up on the floor round dancing, and I motioned all of them to follow me, and we danced out an exit door into another room. And when he got done with it, he looked up, and there wasn't a dancer on the floor. I said, well, if you don't watch them, they can disappear on you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you asked about Russia a while ago, Jerry. I went to Russia. I did several trips across in different places of the world with Nita Page out of California and lots of good tour groups. And we took a tour group to Russia in 1985. And we had 65 people in our group. And we went all over Russia demonstrating square dancing. And it was a cultural dance exchange with the Russian Dancers Association. They would do their demonstration and show us their dances and then we would show them ours and then we got them to dance with us doing play party stuff and whatever. And it worked out really, really well. And as a result of that, we had three ladies come to our caller school, the first one that we did in England. And one, one was from St. Petersburg and two of them from Moscow. And then the second caller school we did in England, there were three other ladies that came over. And so there's about five clubs across Russia, St. Petersburg and Moscow in that area. Kenny Reese was the first one to go in there with a tour group and introduce it to them. And so... That's how a lot of it got started. We had a young lady caller come to our caller school from the Czech Republic who was very good. And went this caller school, the last one that we did in Sweden. And the first time we went, when we went to Russia, I took my sound equipment. I took my Micro 75 and a little 12-inch speaker in a suitcase all by itself. Well, when we got to Russia, we had 65 people in our group, as I said, and my suitcase with my clothes in it didn't make it. So all the square dancers said, did your sound equipment make it? That's all they were concerned about, as long as we had sound, you know, for them to dance by. So I said, yeah, it made it. So I told our tour guide on the way to 
downtown Moscow to the hotel. I said, I need to go to a store and buy some clothes. And he said, we don't have any. I said, what? We said, we don't have any ready-made clothes in Russia. We have tailors. They can make it, but it'd take about two weeks for you to get it. I said, it'd be too late. We'll be gone. I had to borrow clothes for two or three days. I called my first demonstration in Russia with tennis shoes on. And boy, a cowboy don't wear tennis shoes to call square dances. You know, I felt so undressed, it was unbelievable. But anyhow, it did work out good. But the the uh, when they let me know the suitcase was in, they told me to go downstairs and negotiate negotiate with a cab driver to take me to the airport and get the cheapest one you can get. So I was out there, I was taking bids <laughs> on getting the cab. Finally got one, and I, we took off, went to the airport, and I said, "Now wait for me because I won't be in there long." Well, I went in there and I finally got my suitcase and came back out and got in the cab, and here we go back to Moscow. Right in downtown Moscow, the stupid thing had a flat, and he had a pump. And I'm in the middle of downtown Moscow helping him pump up a tire and put on back on that car so we can get back to the hotel. Unbelievable. No, no retail stores at all. We had told the guy, take us to a shopping center. Well, he took us out to a two-story strip thing, and what they had was merchandise that you look at and you order it and then it comes in a couple of weeks later a piece of uh, some ladies wanted some clothes well they're trying on clothes standing there on the sidewalk but then they had to order them and it comes in later yeah and so all during the trip there was one place the the military personnel were trying to sell their uniforms to us and I said what do you tell your people that the, when you get back they could those that could speak English and they said we lost it we get another one so I bought a military coat and a hat he tried to sell me his shoes no, I wouldn't sell it I wouldn't buy his shoes but anyhow we got back to the airport to leave to go through customs and I looked up in another line and there was a a guy with a turban on over there, they found a military uniform in his suitcase, and they grabbed him and handcuffed him, and out he went to another door. And I told my group, I said, we're gone. I'm gone. I'm dead. It's nice knowing you. Everything we had went through x-ray and customs. And our suitcases, we were right at the line to start putting them on the conveyor belt to go in. A tour guide and the airport manager came running to me, and he said, John, get your group. Let's go. Your airplane is leaving. The airport manager said, bypass it. Let's go. I, oh, I, I made it through that. Lucky. I, I'll, I'll be quick and brief as briefly as I can. Went to Egypt twice. And uh, you can't believe how it was over there. Spent four hours in the Great Pyramid the last time in the, in the burial chamber because we had so many dancers in our group and they all wanted to square dance in the chamber which they let us do we were very privileged to be able to do that and so I stayed in there for four hours with a tape recorder so I could call a little bit to each one of them as they came in there it was, it was a heck of a, an experience to get in and out of there another thing that we did I'll tell you this uh, I was booked to call the festival in New Orleans along with Billy Lewis, Harry Lackey, and Chuck Raley. And when we got down there to go on stage, there was a full orchestra on stage, and I said, what the heck are they doing up there? Well, it's union down here in New Orleans, and you can't use this auditorium without hiring a full orchestra, and it's been every year that we've had this festival here, and it's ridiculous, but they get paid to sit up there on the stage. I said, do you want to get rid of them? And they said, well, yeah, how do you do that? And I said, watch me went up there to the conductor and I said I want everyone everybody every orchestra member sitting in their chair with their horns ready to play and when I turn around and give you the signal you play I'd be up there calling they're they're ready yeah. well I never gave him a say he said you didn't give me a signal I said well I didn't need you that time every time I'd get up get the full orchestra up here I made them sit there on stage for an hour and a half and they ain't played a note other than that, most of the time they were down under the stage back in another room drinking beer and cutting up and having a good time. After they didn't get to play, they told me, I said, we don't need an orchestra in here anymore. They never had it again after that. <laughs> well, we got rid of them. 
I'm running late on time. I'm sorry. But I, uh, another experience that I had, and I thought it was great, I taught a one-hour PE credit course in square dancing at the University of Texas at Arlington for 13 years. The first semester was the first half of the mainstream program, and the second semester was the second half of the mainstream program. And I had a lot of college students go through that class. A lot of them met in that class. Some of them even got married and had a bunch of callers to come out of there. And it was real funny. When they were hiring me to do this, I have no college degree. And they said, John, do you have a, uh, a certificate that you are a certified caller? And I said, no, we don't have that. Caller Lab was just formed and was just beginning to talk about an accreditation program. I said, it's in the process. And they said, well, even the lifeguards at the swimming pool have a certification. I said, yeah, but we callers don't. So a lady that was a PE professor at the college was a member of my square dance club, and she's the one that got it started in there. Well, when we went to interview before the director of the physical education department, he looked at me and he said, John, do you know uh, somebody named Jack Murthaw? I said, yeah, I sure do. He's been a longtime friend of mine in Sacramento, California. He said, Jack and I went to college together. If you know him, you're okay. You're in. I was there for 13 years teaching that PE credit course. So lots of good experiences that I've had, uh, and it's just really unbelievable. I'll tell this story. I've told it before. Some of you heard it before, but after Deborah and I got married, it was a several months before she could clear her calendar enough, and she wanted to move to Texas. And I had told her I'd go anywhere she wanted to go. If she was, if I had the wool pulled over her eyes enough that she would marry me, we'd I'd go anywhere with her. So we rented a truck to hire all, bring all her junk. I mean, stuff to Texas. And going down, coming down the Interstate 10, and when you come into Texas on the interstates, there's a monument that says, Welcome to Texas everywhere. It was right at dusk. We were getting into El Paso on the Interstate 10, right at the I slowed down. She said, Is there a problem? And I said, No, I want to take your photo here with this Welcome to Texas monument. We got out. I took her photo. We got back to the truck. I hugged her and I kissed her and I said, Welcome to Texas. And she had a smile on her face from ear to ear. And I looked at her with no smile, and I said, the rules have changed. <laughs> I said, I'm not putting up with that California crap anymore. <laughs> Didn't work, but I tried it anyway. All right. Thank you, John. And... Um once again, we want to thank you all for being with us uh, this morning. We hope that uh, you've uh, you've gained a little bit from our uh, from your experience here and the stories you've heard. Heard, and like I said at the beginning, um, the history of, of what these folks have talked about and have talked about at other uh, sessions like this, uh, I believe, is uh, sometimes lost in the shuffle of of uh, puzzle solving and and what moves go on which program and. And those kind of things. But I believe the history is very, very important. Uh, uh, the traditions of this activity are deep-rooted. And uh, I, I firmly believe that it's one of the greatest, not one of the, the greatest activity. I, I, John Jones again. I also have some history with Lee Kopman. And if you want to know what that is, buy his book. It's in there. <laughs> All righty. Once again, thank you for being with us. Thank you to the panel. <laughs>